Hi, I'm Keith Billis, and this is Live in the Lab. All right. A little bit of weirdness in front of the camera there for anybody who's watching. So I'm like, hey, where's the button? Where's the button? I can't get it going. How did you go viral on TikTok? You were on America's Got Talent. How much do you get paid to be on AGT? Oh, you didn't get paid. Keith and Steve here in Live in the Lab. You're a great interviewer. I love it. 48 miles, 48 hours. And not just once. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I hit 50 last time, and I'm like, yeah, things are a little different than they were 10 years ago. So trust me, things are to keep. You have no time for the BS that much yeah. of society seems to put on the table. Why is that? Like, what you're talking about is real right now. There's just no bullshit here, but it's just real. We brought you in with some Marley. I said, Joseph, let's talk music for a second. You said, well, Keith, oldies, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I've never talked to a sir before. Why are you a sir? In many ways, we're the same story. I came from nothing. <laughs> You came from Earth. I think the old saying goes that if you want a trophy, you climb Everest. If you want respect, you climb K2. I've built my own myself, and it's pretty fascinating when you can have a conversation with yourself with your own knowledge. Have you done that before? Why are we rushing to make these tools if they're all they're going to do is hurt humanity? Does the world need an Oppenheimer moment with AI? What a fun show. I forgot the hook! I forgot the hook! I forgot to invite you in! I forgot to tell you why you're tuning in today. Shannon Houchin joining us today. I got and we have a business idea for you. It's an idea you, it's staring at you right in your face can make you gazillions of dollars. It's true. I'm hooking you. Shannon Houchin joining us very, very, very soon. She's sitting off in the green. She has no idea what she got herself into. I can tell. I greeted her in the green room. She's paying a little bit of attention. And she's like, mm. I'm trepidating. He walking and stepping toes and looking and thinking, hmm. What have I got myself into? Well, I'll tell you what, Shannon Houchin, you got yourself live in the lab with Keith Billis. We're here. We're seven days a week. We go noon central time, one o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific, across YouTube, LinkedIn, X, Twitch, fuck every platform around. Instagram now. It's true. We're on Instagram, Facebook. Hey, did you know Facebook is all the millennials on Facebook doing what? They're shopping. Yeah, they're not socializing. They're shopping. Facebook Marketplace has turned into the largest shopping mall for millennials. So if you're an old person like me, yeah, I'm old. Remember, I'm ancient. I was born like in 1848. I just look great. Good lighting. Good lighting. That's what shaves the years off the face. Guys, like, what's your 52? No, I just jacked up to 6,000 lumens today. Oh, here, let's try this. Whoa, I'm bringing down the age just by the second. <laughs> Oh, that's not that camera's not gonna work. Oh, there, where did he go? Where did he go? He's pressing all the buttons and they're not working. <laughs> all right, so listen, if you guys missed the morning show today, you missed a good one. Keith and Nicole, morning is in the lab. We drop Monday to Friday to wake up with you guys to hold yourself accountable. I know many of you who 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 love what we're doing here in the lab, knock on our door and say, hey, I need that accountability partner. I need somebody to help me get going. I need somebody to help me get to the second week. I need somebody to knock on my door at 6 a.m. to make sure I'm up. Well, guess what? Monday to Friday, Keith and Nicole are in the lab at 7 a.m. Central Time live talking about things like, did you know if, you, if you're a cruiser and you like to be naked while you're on cruises, that could be a problem? And it's true, part of today's show. Today's show also gave you some tips many ways to supercharge your business in 2024 with technology. We also talked about how sleep might help you live longer. <laughs> Started the morning show this week. I might be dying by the day right now. It's true. So I invite you to check it out. The morning show goes live for two hours, seven till nine, LinkedIn, X, YouTube, all the same platforms. Then we drop it onto the podcasters. So by the time you're getting yourself moving, whether it's 715, 815, Listen, wherever you are on the planet, maybe, maybe you're my friends over there in Europe and you're actually ending your day. You're pouring yourself a shot of scotch. You're saying, hey, Mr. Keith, I like sitting down with you and having a shot of scotch while you're talking to these people like Shannon Houchin. <laughs> what accent was that today? I, I don't know. My kids right now are rolling their eyes. My daughter, who I was out last night with Jets game, I love my Winnipeg Jets. Hello, Norva, what's shaking? Sit with Piper last night. I'm like, Pipes, I got to shoot some bits for the show. She's like, Dad. We're not, we're not shooting bits for the show. I'm like, come on, we got to shoot some bits. I need some. I officially, I revealed to my daughter last night, my new title in life. I said, Pipes, I'm an entertainer. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. My whole mission is to entertain and inform. That's what we do here in the lab. We entertain and inform. If you want to be informed and bored, you know where to go. You know what to say, nation. You know what to say. We're here to do what? Entertain and inform. And we're here to do what? Ha, <laughs> you know. All right, Shannon Houchin joining us in a few moments. Listen, I got to get some housework, house, house cleaning out of the way. I invite you to subscribe to all of our stuff. Let me explain. So we've got two dads in the lab dropping every Friday. Content from myself and Dime Manual. 
talking about dad stuff. Last week, we had AJ Zeglin talking about parenting autism. The week before that, Di and I talked about active fatherhood, which I put into action. I was kind of sucking a little bit at that. Put some vulnerability onto the stage and talked about it and recognized that I could do a better job being a dad. I'm trying. I try every single day. Some days I'm not as good as others, but I'm trying. So two dads in the lab, we go every Friday. Mornings in the lab, we go every morning to help you get your day going. And then of course the flagship, the big show with all the big guests, interesting people, interesting conversations for people all around the world. I got any Mike Hancock this week from New Zealand. You got to wait for that show to drop. And of course, Shannon's joining us from, I think somewhere in the US, maybe. We're going to ask her here in a second. So I invite you to subscribe inside.bapple.ai, inside.bapl.ai, the YouTube channel, Keith in the Lab. Just go find us there. Okay. Oh, uh, let's get our conversation moving with our guest, Shannon Houchin. We're talking business. We're talking peaches. We're talking fruit. We are talking. We're talking about how you can make some cash. You know, Uncle Keith likes to make cash. Not making any cash these days, but he likes to make cash. So let, let, me, let me set Shannon up. So who decides to open up a peach stand? Oh, let me tell you what made me book Shannon. <laughs> Found her on the old pod match system. You know, it's like Bumble for podcast people like me and actually not a podcast guy. It's right. Show, show guy. Yeah. Anyways, found Shannon on Podmatch. And what struck me was the opening sentence. Opening a roadside peach stand. Um, first of all, I'm thinking, uh, what? A roadside peach stand? 2024 or 20, 000, whatever year it was she opened it. Opening a roadside peach stand seemed like a crazy idea at the time. Since most people thought the business model was long dead. Yeah, like who opens peach stands? Honest to God. Lo and behold. Lo and behold, a hundred peach stands later, not, not one, not even two. Not, Shannon didn't even stop at five. She's like, no, I'm going to keep building peach stands. So Shannon Houch is joining us She's in the green room, patiently waiting to be brought in. Why don't we go and welcome her into the lab and talk about the peach stand business with Shannon Houchin. Shannon Houchin. Yes. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing today? I'm excellent. I'm coming from Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, I got friends in Texas. Yeah. Lone yeah. Star and- State. And all my exes live in Texas. It's a big old state. It's a big. So you are joining us from Texas and you sell sell peaches. I do. I sell peaches and other produce that um, is grown um, and farmed right here in Texas. That is spectacular. So, Like I said at the opener, I I was struck by the fact that you're right. It's a crazy idea to think I'm going to start a peach stand. But when you think about it, it's equally not. It's perhaps the most brilliant idea. Well, I found it to be so. I wasn't certain, you know, at the outset, but after my first summer, I realized that a peach stand is essentially just an ATM machine. So you decide how much cash you need out of the business and you plug it into the blueprint and that's what you'll end up with at the end of a season. Oh, that's that's a nice way to put it. So let's hook that again. A peach business is an ATM machine. Absolutely. hundred percent. Wow. So business athlete nation. If you're entrepreneurs like myself and most entrepreneurs, we overthink everything. It's like, oh, it's just so overthought. Shannon's driving down the road. Hey, let's go sell some peaches. Oh, it's going to turn into an ATM. Oh, there we go. It's just going to dispense cash every summer for me. Yeah. Simple simple as that. That's that's what happened. I had a friend who um, had been telling me about, he was born and raised in South Carolina. So he told me for probably four or five years, Shannon, you've got to come out and check out my business. He was a reseller. So he would get peaches from the family orchard. And then he would open up roadside peach stands, you know, like at a busy intersection. And he would sell peaches from May to late May to early September. And I mean, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars just, you know, and it's a cash based business. So, um, you know, people are accustomed to that. They, They stop at a peach stand and they're ready to put down some cash. And the promise is that the product they get is like really good. And so you, you inevitably create these raving fans and a customer that has a really long life, lifetime value because they come back over and over again, season after season. Shannon, were you surprised? Uh, yes. At the success of it? Yes. I had for a while, my family had been in what we call coin op businesses. Yeah. And so we liked cash based businesses that were mostly coin operated. So we're talking about car washes, laundromats, arcade, vending machines 
you know, where you're putting cash in. And I was intrigued by the peach business because it is essentially a coin op business. Um, and, and it is an ATM machine. And so once I got into it and I spent that first summer, I realized why. And it's because the business peaches um, supporting local farms and orchards makes people inherently happy. And so people are primed in their brain um, before they ever see us that it's going to be a happy experience. So all they have to do is see our white tents, see our banners, and immediately they're like, oh my God, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And they cannot wait to get out of the car and come to the stand and talk our ears off for 20 minutes about this experience that they miss and treasure and covet and want. And they walk away happy, happy, happy. And in the peach business, you can essentially charge them whatever you want. It, we don't compete against big box retailers or grocery stores. We break that pattern. So we are, there's in the customer's mind, there's no association between our roadside stands and the grocery store. So we create this enormous value, which the customer is willing to pay for. So that's why it's an ATM. I'm laughing not at you. I'm laughing as I'm listening to you because it's brilliant. I love that you used the word happy. Yes. That's how I felt when I booked you. That's how I felt when I selected the music for today's show. That's when I felt when I made a couple, I, I, I don't make notes for my shows, but when I looked at a couple of things to say, okay, I want to be you know, prepared for this. I looked at your website. Everything made me happy because all I could think about, honest to God, Shannon, was this roadside peach stand selling peaches without all of the layers of business and accounting and taxes. I just felt happy that I was going to talk to some somebody who drives, in, I drive somewhere on the side of the road, there's Shannon selling peaches, yet behind the scenes, and I'm saying this with the most love and respect, behind the scenes, Shannon's running some big multi-gazillion dollar corporation selling peaches and all the complexities while her customers are living in harmony and happiness. <laughs> they, they are. They it's Awesome. We create, you know, such a consumer, customer, front-facing experience that yeah. they don't see any of the wheels turning in yes. the background. But we have become, over the last decade of doing this, extremely methodical about the way we approach the business. And, you know, the business blueprint that we've created has evolved and refined over the last decade, but it is all, you know, it all hangs on the customer experience and their inherent happiness. And everything else um, is um, um, designed to elevate that experience. And like, I'll give you an example. It, it, it's wonderful. I, I love it when customers are not happy with something. So say they get a watermelon that's not as sweet as they want. I'm like, yes, here is a great opportunity. And this is what I teach all the kids that work for us. Here's a great opportunity to take a, a bad experience and make it a peak experience. Because when the customer inevitably comes back, and in today's world, people are so hesitant to ask for their money back, to express displeasure because they feel like they're not going to be listened to, mm -hmm. right? You know, the business, the business mm -hmm. owner is not going to appreciate their feedback or their position or their bad experience. But with us, it's like, whoa, I'm so glad you told us. Thank you. And what, what else can we get you today? What else can we set you up with? Yeah. And so we add so much value to that what could have been a negative experience that they leave even happier than when they first approach the stand or when they first you know bought their peaches or watermelon or whatever and that right there going above and beyond and listening and seeing them and then being able to summarize and articulate what their concern is turns what could have been a bad negative experience into probably the best thing that we could do for them. And from that, we get a customer who comes back weekly and monthly and yearly. And then they tell everybody else because that's so unprecedented today that we listen to a customer and give them a voice when they're having a bad experience. And we don't just listen, we make good on it and we we let them know that they're valued. Yeah. Do, do your customers come to you because of your brand, because of the quality of food, because they drive somewhere to find you? Why do they look for Shannon's Peaches? Or, um, yeah. Why do they, why do they come find you? So it's a combination. The roadside stand, 
naturally about 80% of our customer base is impulse. Yes. So they're first time customers. They see our big white tents. Yes. They see our flags and our banners that advertise fresh picked peaches, for example. And yeah. so they will turn around and come back. So that's 80% of the impulse traffic because there is this cultural, you know, iconic um, memory yes. about roadside produce stands. And so everyone has this memory. And when they see it, they're automatically primed, like I said, um, and they're excited to have an experience which puts them in connection with a local orchard or farm or grower. So that's 80% of the business. But over the last decade, we have refined how we market and advertise and we use hyper local marketing. So we do derive of a, a lot of customers now destination based um, through our online um, marketing. And that's everything from, you know, Google Maps to Google business profiles to all of the social media platforms, newsletters, email marketing, text blasts. I mean, we do multi channel um, focus, but we keep it so local and we capitalize off the cultural identity of the locale. So we really talk, we don't just talk about selling peaches. We talk about the town we're in. We talk about the cowboy culture. We talk about fairs and festivals that are going on. And in doing that type of hyper local marketing, the consumer really feels connected mm -hmm. and part of our community because we relate. Mm -hmm. We know the same things. We know the same people. We love the same things. And that makes them feel, you know, that we're trustworthy and that we're their people. And so they will drive to wherever we are and buy produce from us based on that type of connection and engagement. You're selling nostalgia. You're selling a feeling, yes. Mr. Shannon. You're, you're, yes. selling, you're selling 1955. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, even I, I would, so you're a marketer and I bet you there's times you want to refresh, you want to rebrand, you want to modernize, but yet you, you go into the real world in front of your audience and your customers and you look at them and you're like, I can't do that because they're buying 1955 right now. That is exactly right. We, with intention, do not overly sophisticate yes. the look and feel of the stands. And in fact, all of the, the print materials, the flags, the banners, the look of the, the stand and the tent. I look back at like Route 66 in the U.S. and all That's of the roadside attractions. And we emulate that because it, it's just it's yes. in memory banks. Well, that's of Americans. What and they I, they identify with it and so that's why we don't have to do a lot of you know print advertising or you know big signs or have a brick and mortar store because we're iconic and we yes. capture that attention well i, I even I'm, I'm looking at an image here on on uh on your profile on podmatch and it has nothing to do with with your peaches but the way the image is displayed with the thanksgiving pumpkins like like almost any imagery in canva that 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 associates like spring or fall or, or vintage peaches it's it's your imagery in many ways isn't it like there's really no so again that's why i was drawn to you because i love talking to entrepreneurs that just don't overcomplicate anything you're like no i'm gonna go sell a peach and i'm gonna sell i'm gonna be the best damn peach seller in the world Yep. Like that is, and that's the lesson. You know, I had a guest on the show here a number of months back, Shannon, Brian Clayton, Shaken Brian, big, big shout out. And I, as my, my listeners know, as you're going to find out, I become big fans of my guests. I'm a big fan of yours. So you're going to be on my shows for months to come retelling your story about the woman who, yeah, became the expert selling peaches because Brian took 20 bucks in a lawnmower and turned it into a $200 million on demand lawnmower cutting business, like a grass cutting business. Again, boring, cutting grass, everybody does it. Yet he obsessed over doing one thing really extremely well. Yes. And just did it over and over and over and over and always showed up, which is exactly what you did. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. And that, that is such a valid point. Do one thing and do it well. We avoid um, choice confusion because we don't want a customer to approach the business and be overwhelmed by all the choices and then leave. So yeah. we keep it super simple. And the products that we do have at our stands, like peaches, like local honey, 
like watermelons and cantaloupe, they're all complementary. Yes. So what we what we also do is we upsell. So if you're going to buy peaches naturally, you're going to buy a watermelon and a cantaloupe and you'll probably yes. do some too. So we package it all together and then we tell a story about it. So the customer is walking away, not just with their $5 basket of peaches they wanted originally, but now they've just walked away with $75 worth of product. And they're just as happy as they can be. They know the story of each individual item and they're going to go tell their friends and family and share it and then refer people back to us. So we keep it very, very simple and we do it extremely well. Yeah. I'm also going to bet, I'm just speculating as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking off the top of my head. You probably have plenty of looking for the right words and being selective and intentional. You probably have many uh, lovingly age advanced influencers in the rural communities that you, that you reach out to and are, and participate in that don't want to get paid anything. As a matter of fact, they bring peach pies. They bring their everything else to the, to the, to the festival and fairs. And they're supporting what you're doing, loving what you're doing. And it's probably not costing you anything for them to be on board. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, people, and it's so fun. Um, our our cons- customers, we are able to exchange information. Yeah. Like, how do you prepare this? What do you make with your peach? You know, with your peaches, do you do a cobbler? Do you do a pie? Do you do jams and jellies? Do you do muffins? So we do get people that come back around and actually deliver things to us. This is what I made with, you know, the peaches this week. Um, We exchange recipes with people who may not know, like okra is a vegetable that's real big in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of transplants don't know how to cook okra. And so we talk to people about this is how we prepare it. You know, here's a recipe and um, let us know how how it goes for you. So on our Facebook page, um, the Roadside Stand, which is our which is all of our local stands, people are constantly putting up photos right of what they made or of their haul. You know, they unload their big farm basket and (laughs) they're sharing photos of what they bought with their neighbors, their loved ones, and then telling the story of, well, this came from the Eford Orchard, you know, out in East Texas, because that's the story we told them. So consumers really feel like they are doing their part, you know, rather than writing a check, you know, to some charity, they are, they are buying from us and we are a reseller and we're buying directly from the farm, the orchard or the grower. And that, that farm orchard or grower may be two, three, four, sometimes eight hours away in Texas. And so we truck it here and then we bring it to their neighborhood. So we're doing them, you know, a a service by bringing what they could not get almost to their front door. And so they become, they feel like, I did my part today. I shopped local. Not only did they shop local, but they supported all the students that work with us. Mm. And they talk to the students about college and what do you want to study? And, you know, when do you want to graduate? And it's, it becomes like a big family, essentially. Shannon, you're also a social media strategist. Yes. You've uh, done well in the social media (laughs) marketing side of things. Your product is perfect for the social media era. It's it's colorful. It's visual. It's simple. It presents well. It tells, it tells stories. Yes. Honest honest to God. Like again, when I, when I, when I knew you were coming into the lab, I just kept checking off the, oh yeah. Boom. Oh yeah. Boom. Oh yeah. Boom. Like well done. Yeah. It's a product that really does sell itself and it is beautiful to photograph and take videos of. So it's like the easiest thing in the world. I mean, it is so easy to sell peaches. And so many versions of it, right? You can do peach cobbler, you can do peaches, you can do peach, like the variations of the, the one product. Yeah. And, and now our business has evolved to where we're, we are actually brokers and we'll bring peaches in from all over the U S so not just Texas peaches, but we do Georgia and South Carolina, okay. Okay. but now we're doing Delaware and Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And as the season gets late, like into September, October, we move West towards Idaho, Idaho, Utah, Colorado. We're getting peaches out of those states. And so consumers now we're curating, you know, we are hand 
curating selections for the consumer. And this last season, we started like shipping. So you can get, you know, um, a case of peaches and you might get Texas peaches and you might get some South Carolina ones in there. And if Colorado's picking yet, you might get some in there. So we can curate a selection for people, which is something they've never had before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just taking this all in because I'm a fan of simple businesses and I know so is my audience and I, I'm suspecting people are going to hang up the old podcast, the, plug in the old beta or VHS and wrap it up and think to themselves, all right, I'm going to go sell grapes or I'm going to go sell cucumbers or go sell peas or something. Uh, it's just, there's nothing complicated, but, and I'm not trying to disrespect what you've built because clearly, listen, there's a lot of behind the scenes success that goes into successfully selling peaches. A question I would have for you is you have over a hundred stands. Now let's talk a little bit about the model, Shannon. Do you own those stands? Are they franchised? Do you do dealers? H help my audience, help me understand the business model behind uh, Roadside Republic. Sure. So initially, um, we, we owned, I had a couple of partners and we own all of the stands. And then we just have seasonal workers who work for us and they're working in the stands. They're working in the warehouse. They're doing fulfillment, right? Like packing orders, delivering peaches to the stands. Um, and, you know, various other duties. Um, today the business has evolved. And so prior to COVID, um, since we were out, you know, boots on the ground in the field so much. I was teaching people one-on-one -on -one how to open and have a profitable roadside peach stand. And then COVID happened. And so my son and I and some other folks, we sat down and we wrote a whole course, you know, so now it's like an evergreen, you know, um, course that we offer. Mm -hmm. And so we have started bringing, um, people who are learning how to do this for themselves mm -hmm. into our network. So we're building this distribution network that's never existed before. And, you know, we're bringing people in who are selling peaches in Utah and Minnesota, and we've got people in Florida and we've got people like up in Delaware. So we're building a network, one roadside stand at a time and to bring back this business model to American roadways, which is so treasured. So now we have, we still own a bunch of our what we call semi-permanent stands. So we'll put up a big tent, like a 10 by 10 by 20 tent. And that goes up late May and it stays till early September. Never comes down. It's open seven days a week, just running peaches through that. We also have expanded into like local farmers markets. So we will set up on the weekends at local farmers markets. We will do shopping markets. Um, we do um, festivals and fairs. And now we do mobile farmers markets. So we're actually going into neighborhoods. And we'll work with homeowners associations so that we can pop up, you know, in a residential neighborhood for two hours, you know, every two weeks. And then customers can come, you know, and spontaneously shop or pick up their order. So we've expanded our business model. So we're doing both. We still own the majority of the stands that we do, but we're adding more families to our network who are running their own business now. And they're paying for big ticket items like college tuition, a Disneyland family vacation, might be a new car, a down payment on a house, or, you know, select sports where they're traveling around and, you know, investing in lots of athletic gear. So um, it's both now. And we have a blast working with all of the families and the students that come into our network. I love the, you've, you've intentionally used the word network. I listen. Oh, Uncle Keith's a good listener here is the interviewer here in the lab. You've intentionally used the word network a number of times. And I'm, and I'm intentionally calling that out because in my experience, we typically use words like dealership. We typically use words like franchise. We typically use different words to describe our distribution. Rarely in 24 do we call it a network, yet you are calling it a network. That's right. Um, with intention, um, we don't offer franchises. Mm -hmm. um, that's a whole nother can of worms, which mm -hmm. I'm not prepared <laughs> to get into. Um, but what we do offer to the people in our network is um, continuous coaching and support. Since we've been doing this a decade and we know 
almost all of the orchards now in the U.S., for example. Um, and working with the orchards, it's still a one-on-one -on -one relationship because they're still family-owned for the most part. These are independent family-owned orchards, and that requires a relationship with the family so that we can guarantee, you know, a, a certain amount of inventory for all of our stands and then our network. So we help the people in our network acquire their own product. Um, we help them if they want to scale, because the super cool thing, the, well, there's lots of cool things, but one of the, I think the most surprising things about this business besides it makes people happy, is that it's so scalable. It's so dang easy to scale. You can run one stand, you can run a hundred stands and it, and it works. It, it scales very easy once you have all the logistics and, you know, people in place. And it's just taking that, that original one blueprint and just doing it over and over and over and over again. You know, so the, you know, the first year we did it, we were generating, I think, three million, two to three million in um, gross sales, you know, off of the stands that we had. So it just becomes at that point, the people in our network, what works for their family? What works for their schedule? You know, what, what works for their goals? And that's all you got to do. Just put that in the blueprint and it will tell you run five stands, hire 30 people, sell, you know, so many um, pallets of peaches or so many tons of peaches, but it's easy. It's that easy to figure out. So it, it, it just really depends on the family and the individual, what their schedule is, what their goal is. And the business model, the business blueprint can accommodate it and then spit out that money to satisfy their goals. Incredible. Shannon, just excuse me for one second. Nation, I'm wrapping up the Business Athlete Performance Lab. To hell with the complexities of all this. I, I have no desire to keep building this media company. I'm shutting it down. I'm going to start the Peach business. Yeah, but it's just, it's simple. It, apparently you can scale it. I'm starting tomorrow. Keith's Peaches is launching tomorrow. Keith'sPeaches.com baffles done. So see you guys tomorrow. Shannon, I'm going to go learn the business. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'm kidding. Shannon, you can talk about how simple this thing is. Like, oh, yeah, just, I'm just, oh, yeah, I woke up doing $3 million in revenue, just selling peaches. And I'm, and I'm making fun with you and I'm, and I'm calling out the word network because I'm really trying to emphasize to my audience and to the listeners who overcomplicate everything. The Shannon's like, oh yeah, fuck the franchise. Too, too complicated. Be yeah. in my network. I'll help you. I'll help you sell more peaches, Keith. Okay. And I'll probably do a revenue share percentage with you, but just be in my network and I'll help you sell peaches. Okay. Absolutely. Brilliant, simple, Shannon. simple, simple. Just brilliant. Okay, so we've we've eschewed all of the goodness, not all good. Let's talk about some of the badness. Is it seasonal? <laughs> peaches go rotten. Uh, let's talk about the bad side of the peach business, Shannon. Well, the peach business occurs during summertime. Yeah. And if you live in a state like Texas, it's hot as hell. Yeah. It is hotter than hell. And in fact, they call Texas, you know, hell's back 40 because it is so <laughs> hot. Last year... Um, on and, and most of the stands are on concrete or asphalt because we're, we are co-locating with other businesses in order okay. to share traffic and to have plenty of parking and ingress, egress um, on on concrete. You know, it can be 115, 120. Yes. And it is. So it it's it's true labor. I mean, I'm not going to kid anyone. This is work yes. and you will sweat um, and you will be tired and you'll be grimy at the end of the day, you know, moving cases of peaches. So it's outside work. Um, it, it's a lot of labor and um, it's just constant customer engagement because that's the whole business is built on that. It's the customer experience. Um, when we first got started that very first year, I did everything wrong that I could do wrong, but I quickly learned how to fix it. In that first year, we lost thousands of pounds of peaches that did rot in the heat because one of the, we never refrigerate peaches or any of our produce on purpose. Because when you, when you put peaches in cold storage, it aborts um, the ripening and sweetening process. And so we want the peach legitimately to come straight from the tree to our stand and then go home with the customer. So we never refrigerate anything. So it's a tight window that you got to turn inventory. So we have, because I've 
lost lots, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in rotten peaches. I now know how to do it just in time inventory and give ourselves a window of time. So three to four days to turn inventory before it starts to go soft. Unfortunately, where we are, um, the peaches come into the terminal point in Dallas. So we can just run over and get peaches there. We can run to a local orchard and pick them up. So we have mastered just in time inventory. We, um, that very first year when peaches rot, Keith, they're the worst smelling thing. They are terrible. You don't just have one kicking around, right? You got a couple kicking around. So the smell is we're not just smelling one badass peach. <laughs> It is, it is the worst rot ever. And when you've got like a warehouse, maybe five <laughs> or 10 pallets of rotting peaches. Oh my gosh, it's bad. It's so oh. bad. And in fact, you know, we would have to, when peaches start to go bad, you sort through a case, right? Cause you're going to have some good ones still in there. Yes. You put your hand in there and you end up with what we call a water baby. It just explodes in your hand because it's so overripe. And then you just end up with peach goo all over you. So waste that very first year that we did this waste was a big problem. Like we have, you know, pallet loads of peaches that are rotten. We have to dispose of them. So I also learned very quickly that that was not something that we wanted to happen. And we did not want rotten peaches to go into a landfill or the trash or anything else of the city dump. So now, um, if we have any waste, which is really rare now, we, um, upcycle it to local producers. So people who make jams and jellies and pies buy all of our overripe peaches. We have a bunch of commercial um, restaurants and kitchens that we work with mm -hmm. and they make custard and ice cream. Mm -hmm. So now we never have any rotten produce um, at our stands that goes into the trash. It is all re you know, upcycled and sent to other producers. And at the end of the day, the only thing we have to, to um, recycle is cardboard. Wow. So that that's that's what I was going to ask you, which was so again, my, my assumption was that you not only sold the 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 good peaches, but you figured out over over time here in the business how to maximize the value of the uh, deteriorating peaches mm -hmm. and the deteriorating assets. Because again, as I was coming into this session, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so she's selling peaches. Uh, it's it's an it's an aged asset that ages real quick. Mm -hmm. So you got to sell them or else they're going to deteriorate and there goes your margin. So I was really curious when, when I saw you've been doing this for 10 years, I'm thinking in those first years, Shannon, that you're just eating margin on, on deteriorating peaches because you haven't figured that out yet. Right. Am I, am yeah, I correct? That's exactly right. And yeah. it wasn't until later on in the business cycle where you're like, okay, we now have the front end. This has been figured out. We got this really well. Now let's go. Now let's go make money on the back 20% of those peaches that are deteriorating. Right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's brilliant. So then you say to yourself, okay, what are the channels that we can go to, to sell dying peaches? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, lessons for entrepreneurs and again, lessons for don't try to do everything on day one. That's right. The lesson Shannon had was we're just going to go sell damn peaches. We know we're going to lose X percent to crap because they're going to rot on us. But once we have this process figured out, we'll go figure out the rotting part. Yeah. And that's a very good point. Um, we, and it has evolved but we do take it step by step. We don't try to do everything, you know, in a single season because the season's only three to four months. And so we will focus on doing one thing and doing that one thing really well that season. But I mean, I have a long list of things that I want to do with the business, but I wait. You know, I do one thing good, master it teach everybody else. And then the next season we bring, you know, we work on something else. We bring something else into the business and having that kind of focus and strategy has really allowed us to, um, you know, all of the things that we have mastered continue to excel and do really well. So we're not dropping the ball on anything over here in order to focus on something over here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I uh, I don't know if it was Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, one of the entrepreneur shows, I recall a, uh, a business being pitched that uh, went to produce companies and took all their disposed all their disposed produce and basically built a business around that. So again, my line of questioning goes here because I was curious how you hand, handled the the dying part of the asset. Yeah. And that's so yes, there are there are, I've seen several business models that are made off of they like call it ugly, 
ugly produce or misfit produce or, yes. you know, stuff that's not pretty in, in, in today's produce market. So there's, there's beautiful, perfect produce. And that ends up right at the grocery stores because the grocery store can't have ugly produce because at the grocery store, you're not buying off of taste or smell even, or much touch you're buying off of appearance. And so all of the, um, and that's another reason why we get all of the product that's not refrigerated because it is sort of imperfect. You know, the skin may be mottled or pitted um, and it may be misshapen a little bit, but consumers, they're, they're very forgiving. And they also understand that that's real life. That's a leg that's legitimately coming straight off the tree, you know, and into their kitchen. And so um, people feel, I mean, it's just one of those other little, you know, tidbits in the story that we create for people that they're, that they're proud of. And they, and they like to like share that story with everybody else, their friends and family. Shannon, I love the joy that you have and you display when you talk about your business. It, it's, it's, it's really, I know every entrepreneur loves their business, but you sell happiness yes. and, you, and you speak about it. Like when you speak the way you present it, the way you talk about it. I, I love it. I'm a huge fan because again, it's just a simple, it's a, it's a freaking peach, man. There's no, you didn't spend gazillions of dollars raising capital or building factories. You're like, no, we're going to go sell peaches. Be yeah. the best. And, be and the we, best we, we keep it, we keep it in a tent. Number one, we don't want to have the overhead, right? Yeah. For a brick and mortar location. Like why bother? Yes. Um, and so, and then also because the consumer likes that, you know, unsophisticated, you know, kind of mom and pop looking handwritten signs, yeah. you know, kids running around without shoes on. Yes. <laughs> they love that. So we keep it intentionally that simple. And, and I don't, I don't think I will ever, I don't think I'll ever do a brick and mortar store. It just doesn't, it's not the same happy experience for the consumer. Dude, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, you've nailed it. As as 2024 and we move into 2030 and AI and technology and the machines and on on mornings in the lab this morning I showed my I showed my co-host Nicole a, uh, a a video of like a humanoid like C3PO like an like a droid doing things that and I share that with you because there's nothing nostalgic about that there's nothing there's nothing nice and happy about that right so you contrast the future with mm -hmm. what you're selling and people are like and you heard my bit. People are like, why the hell are we creating these AI tools if they're going to hurt us? And there's Shannon happily selling her peaches. Yeah. And as long as I know, people are always going to want to buy peaches. And you're selling nostalgia. You're selling emotion. You're selling feeling. And that, to me, is what's is what's brilliant about your model. And I don't know why you would change. Yeah. Um, it's, we, well, yeah. We keep adding to it, but essentially it stays the same year after yeah. year. Yeah. Do you get bored of it being the same? And I'm being honest because it's, it's, I guess it's a, you, you might want to say no, because the answer is you don't want to say no, but let's be frank here as an entrepreneur, you're doing the same thing all the time. Are there times you're going to yourself, oh, fuck, I don't want to go sell peaches again. Um, So the business model doesn't bore me because we keep adding new segments to yeah. it every single year. Um, Like last year, we, we added online ordering and delivery. So we kind of became a local Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we would allow consumers who might be 25 miles away to go onto the website order, a, you know, a, a farm box. Mm -hmm. um, and then the students would go deliver it. So mm -hmm. that's one aspect of the business that we started last year, never did it before. And it was wildly successful. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are always trying new things like that. So it's always, there's always progress, right? Which progress equals happiness. Yes. And so we're always enthusiastic. And, and my son, Finn, he's my business partner. He's 21. Okay. Um, he, he's really enthusiastic too, because he's been learning this model since he was 11. He's worked in the peach stands with me since he was 11. And now he's really coming into his own and he's running much of the day-to-day -day and the logistics because mama's getting a little tired. You know, I'm the labor part is a little exhausting. I'm not going to lie. And so I'm looking to work on the business and not in the business as much. Yes. Um, because of the heat, because of the, you know, just this, the strenuous nature, you know, of the day, some, some days it's like 12, 15 hours. So that's, that's the hard part after a decade. So I'm pulling back, working on the business. And now Finn 
is taking over like all of the logistics and operations and training and, you know, inventory acquisition and fulfillment and all that good stuff. This is fantastic. Let me tell you why. I've just had a couple of guests on in the last week that both had business partners that were their husbands. So 24 seven, live with my husband, run the business, define the roles and all that. And perhaps you've had that same situation as well. I, I don't know, but your son is, and you said he's my business partner. You, you specifically said, my son is my business partner. Mm -hmm. What talk to me in the audience about that relationship and how that's defined. Yes, he's 21. He's an adult, but when does mom start? When does mom stop? When does business colleagues start? When does business colleague end? When does mom stop giving Finn shit. Like, like <laughs> explain to me in the audience that dynamic, Shannon. Yeah. So the very first year we started this, Finn was 11 and, you know, we spent the entire summer in South Carolina learning the business. So he got, he got a, um, you know, a, a startling introduction to the business right along beside me. And over the years, he's been He's worked in the stands almost like alongside the seasonal workers, and I've handled pretty much everything. But the last, I would say since he was a junior in high school, we ran this really cool experiment, um, and, I, and I did it for social media. And Finn, so he was 17 at the time, um, he had $200 that he had saved from, you know, birthday gifts and stuff. Yeah. And it was, I'm going to open as a 17 year old, I'm going to open my business with $200. Love so it. we, we documented it all on social, social media. Finn took that $200. He went and bought inventory and peaches. All he had was a ratty umbrella, you know, a crappy table and a handwritten sign, you know, that said peaches. And he sold through that 200 bucks that first day. And then he rolled that income back into the next day's purchase of inventory. And he rolled it like that, snowballed it for an entire week. And at the end of the week, he had all of the capital that he needed to really purchase like, you know, the nice tables and a chair for himself and maybe a good tent and, you know, some baskets and bags and, you know, just the supplies and materials that you need. And plus he was in profit. Like I think that first week he was in profit, net profit of 1500 bucks. And that all started off of a $200 investment and that's in seven days, you know, and then within 30 days, um, he was purchasing to give you an idea, $6,000 worth of peaches. So when he would go to, you know, go pick up peaches, it wasn't 200 bucks, it's $6,000 worth of peaches. And that's probably over a weekend, like Thursday to Sunday. So um, that experiment right there, Finn learned all aspects of the business. And so now he's 21. So he has every year taken on more and more of the logistics. And in this year, he's going to become, you know, pretty much exclusively responsible um, for everything. And I just get to sit back and work on the the cool stuff in the air conditioning. Yeah. Uh, excuse me one more time. Nation, I actually am absolutely leaving this business. Uh, I can take 200 bucks, turn it to 1500 bucks in seven days. I'm going to go hang out with Shannon. Can I be your son? Can I cut <laughs> 2000 turn it to 2000? Shannon, what a, what a great story to teach your son. Like honestly, got 11 years old, 10 years later, he's 21 and he's fully immersed. Uh, how proud are you? as as mama watching finn become what he's become and doing what he's doing i am so proud of him yeah um he he is so articulate and he's so cognizant of like human engagement and in, in how to establish a connection and a relationship with a complete stranger you know somebody that comes up to the stand and wants to purchase something or maybe with the other wholesalers we work with or the orchard owners and he he's able to you know, utilize the skills he's learned the last decade. And he's really like this full fledged entrepreneur now. And it's sometimes it's kind of shocking for me because I'm like, damn, he said that really well. He said it better than I could have said it. And so now I kind of just sit back and I'm like, no, you do it, Finn. You, you, you tell the story, you negotiate this deal. And I give him every opportunity just to be his own person, um, his own businessman. And he, he nails it. I'm, I'm not surprised by your answer. I've been very fortunate to spend 53 minutes with you. And clearly Finn has had a great leader.
a great teacher, a great mother who has taught him how to be intentional with his words, how to be a great communicator, how to embrace a stranger right in front of her, him or her and have a great connection. We've had a great connection here in the hour. And I'm not surprised, Finn, I haven't even met the guy, but clearly he's got a great teacher. So good for you. That's just spectacular. Thank you. I, you know, I always love to ask my guests before we started. I missed, I was so excited about this. I was so happy being here today that I forgot the hook, as you heard. And I forgot to ask you, as a polite host, how much time you have. Because I'm sensing we're going to overtime because I have a couple of extra questions that I'd like to ask you. But I want to be cognizant and respectful of your time. Do you have a couple extra minutes for me? I do. Awesome. You having fun? I am, yes. I know that when you sat in the lab, I don't think you knew what you're getting yourself into. It sounded fun. It sounded exciting. So I was ready for it. And are you having fun? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Hyper local. So here's the thing. Hyper local marketing. I, one of the reasons I put this show on is so I can selfishly learn from all these brilliant people out there. So as I'm, as I'm starting my journey and starting this business, part of my mandate and mission is to do some hyper local marketing. And I'm thinking, oh, Shannon's an expert in that. Oh, my entrepreneur listeners would love to hear about hyper local marketing. So why don't we bring an expert on to talk about hyper local marketing? Let's talk about hyper local marketing marketing from your perspective, your POV, and how you've made it work for your business? Yes, absolutely. So most people, most entrepreneurs, business people would know hyper-local marketing really is focusing on SEO as it pertains to your local area. And so that's really looking at blogs, um, making sure your you know, Google My Business profile is optimized, um, utilizing Google Maps, any local directories that are available to you, like Yellow Pages and Yelp and anything else that's appropriate. And so making sure that all of that stuff is integrated right with your website um, and that you are um, you understand the search phrases and the keywords that people in your locality are searching. So that's how most people understand hyper local marketing. And it's all valid. Mm -hmm. um, today, for, for me, particularly, and what I've learned um, over the last decade is it includes all of the social media platforms as well. So you're making sure, of course, your keywords and search phrases um, are integrated into all of your copy that you're creating on social media. Um, and, you know, you might as well put it in your email marketing and, um, you know, any text messages that you're that you're sending out as part of your marketing. But even bigger than that, I think it is it is forming relationships um, and connections with other um, business people, complementary businesses in your locale. It is understanding the mindset of your local customer, the cultural identity of your town, of your city, understanding what makes people happy, passionate, um, advocates, and embracing that and bringing it into your content. So I'll give you an example. We don't just talk about peaches. I mean, I talk about produce all the time and I talk about what's important to our customers. So we are talking about our cowboy culture. Um, right now in Texas, and a lot of people don't know this, Texans go crazy for wildflowers. Um, every spring, the wildflower season kicks off mm -hmm. and it's March and April. And people all across the state will get in their cars and they will take a Sunday drive all day just going to look at roadways at flowers. And so it may take him 30, 50 miles outside the locale um, and they may spend dollars going to eat at a, you know, a restaurant in a town away and um, go to a fair or festival. Yeah. But understanding, right, that experience, that um, culturally iconic um, experience and, and, and uh, um, identifier for the people here connects us. And so when I'm talking about wildflowers, for example, and how much I love them, that engages the community online. And now I've got 10,000 people sending me photos of the wildflowers they saw. Yeah. And so we've created this experience. And the cool thing about that is we haven't talked about a peach. We've talked about this local experience and that's increasing our reach. So now we're on social media and we just, you know, had a post that did, uh, it reached, I don't know, 2.2 million people, for example. We're not talking about peaches at all. We're just talking about local stuff, but it brings people back to our 
social media platforms. It brings them back to our website. It helps them find us. And then because they're like, oh, they're local. Oh, you know, they're Texans. And it just becomes this support network. Yes. So, so hyper local to us means embracing the identity of your town, your community, the people that live there. What are they passionate about? You know, sports teams, um, you know, any other mom and pop operated businesses that we can support and give shout outs to um, and maybe, you know, co-locate in an event together. So I would say that's that's the biggest thing I've learned probably the last five years is not just selling a product, but building a true community that's mm-hmm. long lasting, that'll that'll outlast, you know, that lasts from season to season to season. I think that's the best way to end the show, Shannon, because in 2024, you're not selling products anymore. You're selling you're selling to people in your community. And it's it's as much about building a tribe, building an audience and then introducing solutions to that audience and that tribe that they'll enjoy and then have them become your biggest fans and advocates and it's clearly what you have have uh over the last hour described to me i love how you've described hyper local marketing if i'm to, if i'm to, to paraphrase what i heard from you you're essentially saying we are weaving ourselves into the fabric of a local community we're not just a drop in pop up we're actually belonging we are doing whatever we can to become a member of the community for the period of time that we are there to be a part of the community. And I didn't even use the word sell my product because you exactly. recognize it. If, I'm, if you recognize it, if I make myself part of the community, the product will sell as a result of you being part of the community. That is exactly right. And you will earn loyalty um, and trust in doing yeah. in going about it that way. Yeah, that's brilliant. That is really brilliant. Shannon, do you have any final words? Is there anything I did not ask you that you wanted to make sure we did? We talked about. I saw in your LinkedIn profile, but uh, uh, you know, you had you had you talked about. I got to quickly pull it up here and have some fun with you because I, I need to get maybe critiqued by you. But you you mentioned about uh, the art of asking the right questions and how interviewers should be interviewing people. How is old Chief Bap Lead Uncle Keith done interviewing Shannon Houchin today? Excellent. Very um, on point questions that that um, evoke, you know, a deeper conversation. Of happiness. Mm-hmm. Yes. Awesome. So then, is there any questions that I did not ask that you wanted to make sure we addressed, we had on the, on the record, that the audience could hear? Uh, it's this point of the show where it's your platform to talk about the peaches, talk about where they can find you, how somebody wants to connect with you, how somebody might want to learn from you. Shannon, the floor is yours to do that just right now. All right. Thank you, Keith. Well, you can find my son and I, Finn, at roadsiderepublic.com. And we have a evergreen course that we've created for people who want to learn how to do this themselves. Um, And it's a course you can take at your own pace. You don't have to hurry through it. But I will say that we are about 60 days out from peach season. And this is the best time of year to go ahead and get yourself set up for the coming season. I call it CEO time. So this is off season time where we are we are getting our act together. We are scouting our locations. We are making sure all of our materials and supplies are ready to go. We are hiring folks. Um, we're talking to the orchards and growers so that we can make sure we have all of our inventory. So all of the, you know, the logistics and operation stuff we do now. So if this is something that you're considering, please check out our website, roadsiderepublic.com, um, our course that's available there. And you can find us on TikTok. We do a lot of videos kind of behind the scenes, a day in the life of, you know, what it means to do X, Y, and Z. So you can find a lot of additional content there. Awesome. Awesome. Shannon Houchin, thank you for joining me, joining Business Athlete Nation to talk about Roadside Republic, selling peaches, and keeping it simple, and most importantly, keeping it happy. Thank you, Keith. I had a great time. Awesome. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to just put you back in the green room for a second. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience, and then I'm going to walk you out, all right? Hang tight. All right. There goes Shannon. That was happy. Yeah, I got some happy music walking us out here today. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat as much as I did. Uh, I had a motive, if you could tell, the line of questioning with where we went with it. I love Shannon's business. The key learning nation is this today. Don't overcomplicate it. If you, if you're if you're struggling to get started, just start, and you might be surprised by what happens. And oh, and 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 if you're selling produce, maybe sell less of many of them. Just sell one of one of them. 
I don't know. Maybe that's the worst advice you can get today from old Uncle Keith here live in the lab. I'm going to get out of here so I can go walk Shannon out of here. I'm happy. I had a great start to the day. Mornings in the lab with Keith and Nicole. We're back to my morning on Friday. And then, of course, tomorrow, two dads in the lab. Part two, AJ Zeglin, parenting autism. You'll find us at noon, central time. Oh, no, actually, that drops in the podcast. Di and I are here live tomorrow. Man, we've got so many shows happening. I'm just kind of kind of confused from time to time what's going on. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to walk Shannon out, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, ciao.